Today we'll be talking about a childhood illness that can be prevented by vaccination, but it still causes significant disease burden around the world in places where vaccination rates are low. Outbreaks can even crop up in communities where parents decide against vaccinating their children, as was the case with this little boy. Logan was a healthy four-year-old who lived with his parents and his 15-month-old brother Wilkes in Beverly Hills, California. Both his parents worked as visual effects producers for a nearby Hollywood studio, and every year the boy spent a week in England visiting family. This year, Logan and Wilkes were excited to spend time with their English cousins. But one week after returning from England, Logan was sent home early from preschool after his teacher noticed that he appeared ill with a high fever. The day after the fever began, Logan also developed red and itchy eyes, a runny nose, and a cough. While brushing Logan's teeth one night, his mother also noticed bluish-white specks inside his mouth on the inside of his cheeks. His parents at first thought he just had a cold, but four days later, they noticed that a rash had begun to form starting at his hairline and spreading down his face. The rash was made up of small, slightly raised red spots, which blanched white when his skin was gently pressed. They made an appointment for Logan to see his pediatrician first thing the next morning. By the time Logan arrived at the doctor's office, the rash had spread to cover his neck, trunk, and arms, and the small red spots on his face had begun to coalesce into large red plaques. Overnight, Logan had also had some episodes of diarrhea and vomiting. The pediatrician had cared for both boys since they were born, so he knew that neither of the children had received any of their routine childhood vaccinations. The pediatrician had multiple long discussions with the boys' parents over the years about the risks of not vaccinating them, but the parents consistently refused, stating that they weren't willing to inject their children with toxic chemicals, which they believed might cause serious side effects, including autism. Logan's parents had joined with a group of like-minded parents in their community to start an independent preschool attended by only seven children and staffed by two full-time highly qualified teachers. Unlike most schools in California, this preschool didn't require proof that the children's immunizations were up to date, and most families in the preschool either did not vaccinate at all or used alternate delayed vaccination schedules. The story of why so many parents in Logan's community were choosing not to vaccinate begins in 1998, when an English pediatrician named Andrew Wakefield published a paper in a respected English journal called The Lancet, describing a case series of children with autism and bowel problems, many of whom he claimed had developed their first symptoms within days of receiving their measles, mumps, and rubella, or MMR, vaccine. Over the next few years, Wakefield continued to publish articles suggesting that the MMR vaccine was a trigger for autism, and by 2002, this had become one of the most influential media stories in the United Kingdom. Ultimately, it was discovered that Wakefield's work was fraudulent. He had a financial interest in legal groups that were looking for new ways to sue vaccine manufacturers, so he had fabricated the link to autism. Since then, many large epidemiological studies have found that there is no association between autism and the MMR vaccine. But by the time Wakefield's work was discredited, the controversy had already produced widespread distrust of vaccines in the UK and many other countries. Vaccination rates plummeted, leading to a resurgence of measles in places like England where immunization rates fell below the level at which a non-immunized individual would be adequately protected by herd immunity. The distrust of MMR and childhood vaccines in general continues today in some communities, including Logan's immediate community in Beverly Hills. After performing a physical exam and taking into account Logan's recent travel to England, the pediatrician in this case immediately suspected that Logan had measles. 
While he was in England, Logan had visited a family friend with an undiagnosed measles infection who had coughed in the area where the children were playing, spreading infectious respiratory droplets, some of which were breathed in by Logan. The virus then colonized the surface of his tracheal and bronchial epithelial cells, quickly replicating and spreading from cell to cell until it involved most of his respiratory tract. The measles virus was able to spread so effectively because it suppresses the antiviral warning signal, interferon alpha, in Logan's infected cells, diminishing the usual immune recognition mechanism. Meanwhile, dendritic cells and alveolar macrophages in the child's airways internalized the measles virus, and the infected dendritic cells carried the virus to Logan's lymphatic tissues. T and B lymphocytes were also infected with measles, leading to a generalized immune suppression and making Logan more susceptible to dangerous complications like severe bacterial pneumonia or encephalitis. Fortunately, Logan didn't show any signs of these complications. The T and B cells also spread the virus all over Logan's body, infecting epithelial cells. In the skin, this caused the characteristic rash associated with measles. In the oral mucosa, it caused the coplic spots, and in the GI tract, it caused diarrhea and vomiting. And back in the respiratory tract, it caused a runny nose and cough, which allowed large numbers of virions to exit the host and easily infect others. Measles is highly contagious, causing illness in more than 90% of susceptible household contacts, so the doctors urged Logan's parents to consider vaccinating their younger son, especially because his young age put him at a higher risk of measles complications. If given within a few days of exposure, the MMR vaccine can provide some protection from infection or modify the clinical course of the disease. In addition to managing the immediate risk to Logan's household, the pediatrician obtained samples from Logan to confirm the clinical diagnosis of measles. He ordered blood tests for measles-specific IgM and IgG and sent throat swabs to the local health department for culture and PCR testing for measles virus. The pediatrician knew that the local health department needed to be involved. Measles is a diagnosis that requires reporting to public health agencies, which respond with measures to control the spread of infection and prevent a larger outbreak. In this case, the health department would have to ensure that all of Logan's contacts, including his preschool classmates, were notified of their potential exposure. Logan was supported through his infection with good hydration, acetaminophen for his fevers, and close monitoring for signs of secondary bacterial infections. Six days after his rash first appeared, it began to fade into coppery brown patches, which then started to peel, signifying that his infection was resolving. Now that he's had measles, Logan will have lasting immunity and is no longer susceptible to measles reinfection. His parents decided to immunize 15-month-old baby Wilkes. After this experience, they're also considering catching up both children on their other recommended childhood vaccines.